Hello, I'm Sidney Pollack. I directed Out of Africa, and right after this message, John and I will be back to talk about it. Well, when you watch Out of Africa, you might be asking yourself, is this a portrait of a country, or is it a portrait of a dream? Sidney Pollack, can we call it a dream in some ways? Very, very uh, accurately, I think. Um, it was, a, I suppose more accurately, a memory that was filtered through a kind of poetic imagination, uh, written after the fact, years after she had been to Africa and had all these experiences, loved two men, fell in love with the country, lost everything, including both men, and then went on to write about it in the most poetic, mm -hmm. dreamlike uh, way. And, and a dream cast, too. <laughs> yes, it is a dream cast. <laughs> in fact, working with the likes of uh, Klaus Maria Brandauer and maybe a Robert Redford must represent some polarities in, in temperament, let's say. Well, yeah, certainly. I mean, they work uh, slightly differently. Their backgrounds are different. They're different kinds of people. And that works very well, I think, for the film. You know, uh, Redford has a certain kind of, uh, in, in American terms, aristocracy, I suppose. He's uh, a man of very few words, one senses a kind of withheld, withdrawn individualism in him, a sense of privacy. And he'll take you to the mat if he wants to do something his way too, right? He won't, he won't hold back. Oh, no, no. He's yeah. a very opinionated uh, guy. Mm -hmm. We've worked together six times now, so we've gotten each other's signals down pretty pat. <laughs> <laughs> I've called the picture a dream. Working on a day-to-day -day basis, however, it must have been anything but at times. Could you take us to the locations and tell us a little bit about the day-to-day -day work? Well, first of all, Africa, you know, today is not the Africa that uh, certainly I grew up picturing. I, I had a sort of a picture of a rainforest, Tarzan-like uh, yeah. Africa. It's not. It's, as you see from the film, it's a, it's a real Garden of Eden in a way. It's a kind of a paradise. It is a, a country that's emerging and is in a state of transition now, and one feels that very strongly. There's a lot of bureaucracy there. There's a certain amount of suspicion of us coming in there to film and how the Africans are going to be depicted. Mm -hmm. They're a little distrusting of us, and I don't blame them. They've been exploited to death, you know, in the past, first by the, well, way before the English, by other people even, you know, their slaves were taken from there, and they're still trying to, you know, get out of bush clothes and into suits, and, and they don't know how they're going to be depicted by us. So we were looked at a bit of scance there, number one. Number two, we had enormous weather problems. There had been a drought for three years before, and we got the kickback of the drought, so the heavens opened up, and that makes it very tough to get around in Africa because there really aren't any roads. There's no heavy equipment there the way we think of heavy equipment, so we had to build all our roads by hand, our landing strips by hand. When you work with animals, they say, you know, the old saying, babies and animals are, are you know, what make it all impossible to do. And the lions uh, in this case are interesting. We had lions, we had buffalo, we had, you name it, we had it. But you had there. to bring them there, correct? We had to bring the lions. As, as most people know, I think Kenya is now a game reserve, and it's hands off on the animals. You know, they flourish beautifully there, and there are vast herds of them, but you can't get them to do what you want them to do. You wouldn't have the time if you wanted to, and number two, it's against the law. So we were able to film these herds of wildebeest and Cape buffalo and, you know, monkeys on vast herds of of those wild animals, but the lions who had to do specific things we had to bring from good old Topanga Canyon in California. Talk about Coles to Newcastle. Uh, it's a little odd to be bringing wild lions to Africa, but we, we, we brought these tame lions there. Um, we had all of those problems. We had the logistic problems of trying to move a, a, an army of 250 people around in tents, you know, feeding them, getting the, the food in for 250 people, keeping fresh water that was drinkable. Uh, finding bathrooms and showers for them out in the middle of the wilderness, being in radio contact with our base camps. The phone service is not what it might be there, so just the uh, communication itself is a difficulty. But now, having said all of that, did you find happening to you what happens to Karen Blixen in her writings on Africa? It begins to exert a powerful hold on oh, you. Oh, there's no question that there's a soul to that country, and if you, if you are in the market for it, uh, and it, uh, it was a long time coming for me, I must say, because I was too concentrated on the job at hand to really appreciate the country at first. But uh, there were nights when we were on safari, wor you know, working down in the Maasai Mara or in the Rift Valley, where you'd finish work and get a drink and sit out in front of your tent. And the, you're so high up in the highlands, and the equator is right there, and so it gives you the illusion that the moon is five times bigger than it 
is here when you see it. And watching the moon come up and listening to the animal sounds at night and getting the sense that uh, that this was all one great killing ground in a way, and that this, in fact, was where man began. You know, you sometimes, feel it. sometimes does it take a life of its own? A project like this, Blixen says in the book, that dreams. The special fascination of them is that they have a life of their own. Mm -hmm. Did a big project like this occasionally just blossom like that, almost unbidden? Well, I think all films do. I mean, they that you start as carefully planned as you can be, and then the film begins to dictate its own mm -hmm. rhythms and its own moves as you begin to film day by day. It, that plan that you have in your head goes by the wayside and something else takes over I and mean, that's what happens anytime you, you plant the bush but then you have to trim it and shape it as exactly. it grows uh -huh. exactly. you have said that this is a bit of a risk for you you're a surefire director if there ever was one your track record is great why would you call out of africa a risk well i say it's a risk in the sense that it's uh you know it's a long film it's a film that's not in the vein of the kinds of films that have been playing all year or this summer. It's certainly not a film that's designed specifically for young people. Um, it doesn't have the narrative drive that we've sort of trained our audiences to like, which comes from television, really, and MTV and all of that, where something has to be happening that's wildly exciting or melodramatic every 30 seconds. It's, it's a film that takes its time to tell its story. I don't say that that's better or worse. It's just different enough mm -hmm. that it is a bit risky. So, when you look into that lens at all of the people looking at you right now who are about to go to see out of Africa, what do you hope that they come away with when they leave that theater? Well, I hope the sense of having glimpsed uh, a paradise that was lost through the eyes of a woman who is extraordinarily courageous and special, and I hope that they'll feel that they've learned something about ownership, possession, relationships, tolerance, um, and seen uh, the beauty of that country and the people of the country, and watched, I think, a very epic and romantic love story. And learned something about dreams, too. <laughs> Sidney Pollack, chasing down one in Out of Africa. And in New York City for KCTV 5, I'm John Tibbetts.